Good afternoon. My name is Jay Mariani. I'm the Chief of Branch of Fiscal Operations for the Division of Federal Employees Compensation. I'm joined by Joshua Novak with the Branch of Technical Assistance. We both are here to present on workers' compensation. Um, we ask that if you have any questions, you please chime in as much as possible during the presentation. We'd be happy to answer them as we go along. War forewarned, this is normally an eight-hour class. We're going to try to squeeze as much as we can into an hour and a half. But if we start going too fast, again, please chime in via the, our email moderator, <clears throat> and we'll respond to as much as we can as quickly as we can. Okay, to begin, this is the actual contact information where you can send the emails to. Second slide of the um, presentation. So an overview of the FECA. The FECA is the Federal Employees Compensation Act. It's the act which guides what we do. It's actually started in 1916. We're the oldest federal benefits program in the country. We outdate even Social Security by a good 20 years. We provide compensation coverage to over 3 million civilian federal employees, which includes wage loss, all medical coverage, and vocational rehabilitation, and any <clears throat> assistance in returning to work. We also provide assistance to dependents in the case of a death. Clearly, we're administered by the Department of Labor, and we adjudicate the claims for the benefits for ongoing cases. So it's not just the adjudication of the case, but it's the management of the case until the injured worker is able to either return to duty or has been deemed unable to return to duty. In fiscal year 2013, I'll read off some numbers that are, you have on your slide. We had over 111,000 new cases to cover approximately 250,000 injured workers. We spent $2.9 billion. Of that, $940 million was for wage loss, and 117 million for death benefits. The map shows the coverage that we have across the country. We're arranged by, dist our district offices are arranged geographically. So depending on where the, the injured worker lives, that is the office that actually covers them. Just a note for those that are that do workers' compensation work as perhaps as a collateral duty, that all of this is covered under the Privacy Act. Employee, the information goes strictly to the employee. It is not part of a regular personnel record. The, the employee can designate a representative or an attorney or someone else to, to discuss their case with us, but otherwise the normal guidelines of the Privacy Act are followed. Documents that make up the claim file in particular are protected and are not to be with any other personnel record. There must be a separate system of records simply for the workers' compensation case, and it can't be used for any other purpose other than workers' compensation. We actually, even if the agency keeps a copy of the records, we are actually the owners of those records. Um, towards that end, HIPAA does not actually apply to OWCP. We have a specific exemption from it because of our systems of records. Hang on a second, I'm sorry. It seems to have gone, gotten ahead of myself. Okay, on to the actual specifics. Types of claims. We have three basic types of claims. There's traumatic injury, occupational disease, or death. A traumatic injury is when someone is injured on one specific day or shift. A typical that you'd expect, someone trips and falls and injures themselves. An occupational disease is exposure to some condition or some other injury, so to speak, that lasts over more than one shift. Something, say, like carpal tunnel or a cancer or a breathing condition. The last would be death, when a federal worker is killed in the line of their duty. In order to do this, we have there's five basic factors that we consider. We call this the five basics. These are the conditions of coverage. Time, civilian employee, fact of injury, performance of duty, and causal relationship. The first three are fairly straightforward. There is a time limitation in which to file a claim that must be met, depending on the claim. Civilian employee, the person clearly has to be a civilian federal employee. We do not cover military members or contractors, with, except for certain very limited exceptions. And then fact of injury, there has to be an actual specific diagnosis of an injury. The next two conditions are the ones that get a little more complicated, and I'll spend a little more time talking about those. Performance of duty. This is when the injury occurred is being, is the injury occurred to the injured worker while they were in the performance of their federal duties. It has to generally occur on a work premise, but there are exceptions to that as well. They must be performed with their assigned duties, and 
I'm sorry, personal comfort activities reasonably incidental to employment, which is a very technical way of saying as long as it's related to what one would be doing at work, it is covered. So that means employees at lunch, if they're in a uh, employer-sponsored exercise program, that would be covered as well. Things like driving to work are not covered. Um, employees on TDY would be covered so long as it's related to the duties that they're supposed to be performing at, on TDY. Again, that's the sort of off-duty injuries. For example, Josh and I are here at OPM giving our presentation. If something were to happen to us and we were injured on our way returning back to the Department of Labor, that would be covered because this is part of our assigned duties. It has to be something that's reasonably considered incidental to employment is basically the way to think of it. Come on. There we go. Other factors, that, things that are included. You can see there's a, a running list here. Some of them aren't necessarily intuitive. Horseplay. Um, if someone decides to have races up and down the hallway and somebody trips and hurts themselves, that odds are good that could be covered. Um, an assault, so long as it, it stems from the workplace, would be covered. If someone's doing their union activities that are specifically just for the union, that still would be covered. Uh, idiopathic falls, which aren't necessarily related to the, an injury, but as a result of something else you fell and hurt yourself, could be covered as well. Again, these are all very case specific, but these are just circumstances of all the things that we have to consider in order to determine if the employee's within the performance of their duties. There are some things that we will not consider. Willful misconduct. If you're being told not to do something, if the employee's been warned that racing up and down the hallways is not a good idea, yet they continue to do so and injure themselves, that would be good reason to not cover them. Um, drug or alcohol intoxication clearly would bar you from being covered, and intent to earn yourself or others would also bar coverage. Causal relationship. This is the link that gets you between the performance of your duty and the actual injury itself. You have, we have to have a causal relationship to explain why the condition you have is linked to the performance of your federal duties. It's very critical for us. This is the real piece that, that is most important. And it's generally the claimant's physician has to provide this to us. They have to explain to us why that person's carpal tunnel is related to the duties that they have. If the person is a clerk typist and spends all day typing, it may seem intuitive that they would have carpal tunnel, but we can't just go on, it seems like a good idea. We need the physician to tell us, because they type, they have these symptoms, and as a result of their federal duties, they now have this condition, and this condition has disabled them. So we need that sort of link is what it really comes down to. And as it says the last bullet, the amount and the degree will depend on the type of injury. It may be a very minor degree, but still contribute to the injury. It could aggravate or precipitate an injury and would still be covered. And with that, I will pass over to Mr. Novak. Thank you. So I'm going to discuss a little bit more, try to get into the weeds about a CA1 in particular and a CA2. So as, uh, as Jay mentioned earlier, a CA1 is needed for a traumatic injury. And that's any injury that you have that would occur during a single day or a work shift. And as you mentioned, it could be a trip and fall incident. It could be smoke uh, inhalation from something that might have happened. Um, so once again, it's identifiable as to the time and place of occurrence and a member and function of the body affected. So a CA-1, it needs to be submitted to the employing agency within 30 days of the date of injury in order to be eligible for COP. And I'm going to go into uh, exactly what COP is. It stands for continuation of pay, and that's a system that's set up in order for injured employees to consider or to continue receiving uh, compensation, monetary compensation, while claims are adjudicated by uh, OWCP. So not all CA-1 forms are submitted from agency to OWCP. You need to follow the filing instructions on the back of the form. So as we mentioned at the beginning, we received in fiscal year 2013 over 110,000 claims. So we, we don't have the support or even the, we don't have the need to adjudicate every single claim that comes in. Sometimes someone might get a paper cut, they'll file a claim. There's no medical related to a paper cut injury. There's no time loss. So they'll just file it and that won't necessarily need to be submitted to uh, OWCP. That's something that the agency can hold on 
uh, in their workers comp specialist desk and then if injury does manifest from that paper cut, say it's infected, then at that time the report can be submitted. Uh, if the form should be filed, it must be transmitted to OWCP within 10 work days from the date the agency received notice, not necessarily 10 days from the date the form was actually signed. So here are some of the agency responsibilities when an injured employee begins to fill out a CA-1. You're going to want to review the form for completeness. So a CA-1, if you've never seen it, it is a, it's a two-sided document with the first side for the injured employee to fill out and the second side for the supervisor slash injury compensation specialist to uh, review and fill out. So when you get it, you're going to want to make sure that the employee has filled out all the information necessary. At the same time, you want to be able to make sure that this injured employee can receive the medical treatment that they need in order to uh, treat whatever happened. So in conjunction with the CA-1, you also want to submit and give them a CA-16, which is a medical authorization form. And that's kind of a, a free pass that allows the injured employee to go to a treating physician to get checked out. Um, you want to advise the employee of the right to elect COP, and you want to advise the employee of their responsibility to submit medical evidence. Because as with any injury and any time off, you're going to need the injured employee to submit proof that they are actually injured and that they do need this time off to, uh, to recuperate and treat. And we can't emphasize enough, we really rely on the employing agencies to give us information. There is no central database anywhere. OPM has lots of information, but they don't have a lot of the stuff that we need to do what we do. So whether it be this form or the other forms we talk about later, we have to rely on the information you send us in order to fill out a case and to adjudicate a case, as well as to pay people. So when that's not accurate, then we end up with problems. So it's really, really important that we get good information, both from the claimant filling out the form and as well as the agency. Thanks. So in the same vein, there's another type of uh, case that we receive in our large amount of case, and we call these a short form closure. So what these are, these are administratively handled to allow payment of up to 1500 in medical expenses and payment of COP uh, by the agency. So say you have someone who was injured in a car accident and their airbag went off and they might have had a chest contusion. They're still fine, they show up to work the next day, but they have some sort of medical uh, treatment necessary with that. We'll notice that the case is not controverted, they didn't miss any time from work, so our system, our, uh, our data entry people, will automatically uh, put, a f put a note and code it a certain way for this case to be uh, authorized for payment of up to $1,500. If at some time medical treatment does go above that $1,500, the case is automatically flipped open for adjudication. So these cases are not reviewed or adjudicated by the claims examiner unless they start to miss time from work or the medical bills are above that $1,500 threshold. So now I'm going to get into, yeah, we have a question from the field. All right. They ask, um, what happens when a manager and or HR drops the ball and doesn't submit the CA-1 within 10 days? Employee does not need COP. If there is an impact to the employee, even if it wasn't the employee's fault. Well, we wouldn't, we certainly would still adjudicate, it wouldn't not impact adjudication of the claim. That's for certain. We do have timeliness standards for all the agencies in terms of submission of CA-1, CA-7s, all of our forms that they have a requirement to submit it within a certain amount of time. So it, it impacts their statistics. Um, we also have a lot of agencies, uh, which Josh will talk about later, have gone to our electronic filing system called eComp, which actually has reminders that go to the supervisors that tell them, you have not filed this form yet. You have not forwarded this form. The employee has completed it, but you have not done your portion of it. Um, we rely on the supervisors to send, because we don't know what we haven't received yet, but the employee can always contact us and say that they've not, they've submitted a form and they've not been notified of a claim being filed and we would pursue it with the agency. Great. That 10-day filing is an agency regulation. If it, like he said, if it, we receive it after that 10 days, it's still going to be fine. An injured employee has, for a traumatic injury, three years to submit a claim. So, and even if it goes over that three years, if they can show that they notified their supervisor within that first 30 days, then we're still going to we're still going to look at the claim, we're still going to adjudicate, and we're still going to consider it yeah, timely. It, it certainly wouldn't affect time on the claimant side. Yes, sir. Another question. 
Are summer students and volunteers covered under FECA, and can they file a CA-1? Yes, you can always file a CA-1. Whether you're not sure of coverage or not, we always encourage people to file the claim to see if they are, in fact, covered. Some volunteers are. Uh, students can be. It just depends on their status, if they're defined as employees by the employing agency, generally. We tend to follow the guidelines of what the agency has called them. It's usually by regulation that we've set up that we cover certain types of volunteers. So it varies widely from agency to agency. So that's why we generally encourage people to go ahead and file the forms, and then we will come back and tell you if you're not a covered federal employee or not. It would get denied for federal employee status. Right, yes, and we see, I'm oh, sorry. What if an independent employee It would come straight back to you because we wouldn't know who they worked for. We need certain codes. Um, all of the costs that we, incur are billed back to the agencies and there's a coding system that has to go with that so that we can't even associate the claim with a particular agency without those codes and a claimant would have no way of knowing those. So whenever, we, if we got a form without the agency, unless it was very clear, say for example, they put down that they were a letter carrier and we knew it was USPS, we would send it to the USPS and ask them to complete it for us. But if we really had no idea, if the person just said I'm a secretary, for example, we would probably return it to the claimant saying you need to submit this through your employing agency. The only time that we would accept a form is a CA-2A, which is a notice of recurrence. If someone suffers a recurrence and they're separated or retired from their agency, then at that time the injured employee can just submit that form directly right. to OWCP. Right, because we would already have the information on file as to who they originally worked for. Correct. Okay. Great. So, COP defined. So. Continuation of regular pay for up to 45 calendar days of wage loss due to a disability and or medical treatment after a traumatic injury. So the intent of COP is to avoid any interruption of pay while the claim is adjudicated. So if an injured employee gets hurt, they're not gonna be able to work, and at the same time, they're gonna be filing the forms. So then there's that gap between the time OWCP can accept the case and the time that they're not working. So we don't want them to not be able to pay their bills. So the COP would cover that time before an adjudication is made in the case. Uh, COP is paid by your employing agency. So it's also subject to deductions from pay, such as the income tax, the retirement, the allotments, um, your TSP would come out still. And the decision to use leave over COP is not irrevocable. So if you're injured, you don't have to elect COP. You can use your sick or annual leave. And an employee who uses that type of leave can elect COP within one year of the leave usage um, after the case is accepted by OWCP. So continuation of pay eligibility. So I need to stress that continuation of pay is only, um, only applicable in a traumatic injury. It's not for occupational claims. You need to file that CA-1 within 30 days of the date of injury, and uh, time lost from work needs to begin within 45 days of the date of injury. Uh, so going, continuing with eligibility, the employer must continue the pay of an employee who is eligible for COP and may not require the employee to use his or her own sick or annual leave in almost all circumstances. However, while continuing the employee's pay, the employer may controvert the employee's COP, entitlement pending a final determination by OWCP. So OWCP has the exclusive authority to determine questions of entitlement and all other issues related to COP. So what this slide means is the agency should begin uh, paying COP, and the decision on whether or not to terminate it is made by OWCP. If they want to controvert the COP, and I'll get into the reasons why they can do that, they can do that. But during that controversial period, they should still continue to pay the uh, COP. And if for some reason it's denied and we decide that they shouldn't have received COP, then the injured employee would have to uh, pay that time back. The idea is that if someone's injured and can't work, and perhaps they don't have a lot of leave in order to cover themselves, that they don't suffer a hardship because they've got a work-related injury. So COP is supposed to continue to pay them until we make a determination one way or another. So here are the nine reasons for controverting COP. And controverting COP is different than, um, than challenging the facts of the case. So if you're challenging a case, say you went bowling with someone the last night and they hurt their back during it, then the next day they claim their chair broke and they hurt their back at that. You can challenge the claim for that. Um, but when you're speaking controversion of COP, these are the only nine reasons in which you can controvert the COP. 
either the disability is a result of an occupational disease or illness, so once again, COP is only applicable for a traumatic injury. Um, the claimant status as an employee is defined by uh, 5 U.S.C. 8101, which typically says that um, if they're not a civil employee, then they wouldn't be eligible for COP. If the employee is neither a citizen nor resident of the U.S. or Canada, if the injury occurred off the agency's premises and the employee was not engaged in official off-premises duties. To continue, the employee's willful misconduct, intentional harm or death, or the proximate intoxication. The injury was not reported on a form within 30 days. If the work stoppage occurred after 45 days, if the employee reported the injury after the employment was terminated, they're not gonna be entitled to COP. And if the employee is enrolled in the Civil Air Patrol, Peace Corps, or other groups covered by special legislation. So the decision to terminate COP is again, uh, one that's made by OWCP. However, the agency can stop doing COP for, um, for any return to work with no loss of pay. So if someone was out and then they returned to their full duty job, they would stop paying COP and just put them right back on the uh, agency rolls. If the employee's period of employment expires, you can terminate the COP. If the OWCP directs the employer to stop, so if you receive notification from our claims examiners or anyone from our office indicating why, uh, COP should stop. And if COP has been paid for 45 days, uh, it should be stopped because it's only eligible for that 45 day period. When calculating COP, you're gonna take the pay rate for COP purposes is equal to the employee's regular weekly pay rate. So it's, it's pretty much continuing to pay their salary of what they were earning at the time that they were injured. It's gonna exclude overtime pay, but it will include all other extra pay except to the extent prohibited by law. So if the person was a law enforcement officer and was receiving some sort of premium pay for that, that would be considered into it. Or if they had a weekend shift and they received Saturday and Sunday premium, those types of things can do it. And changes in pay which would have otherwise occurred during the 45 day period are to be reflected. So if a person injures themselves and they begin receiving the COP and they were eligible for a step increase 10 days into that, then you would reflect that in their COP and they would get an increase in that. However, if they started receiving benefits from OWCP, we would go back and take their date of injury salary. Uh, yep, question? Yeah, we got a couple. What happens if a supervisor refuses to complete the part that they are supposed to complete of the form? Well, they can't really refuse. I mean, if the immediate supervisor won't fill it out, it would get moved up the chain. Or if it came to us, we would send it to someone else within the agency. I can't say that's something we've come across. Mm -hmm. We do have some agencies where people are stationed overseas or perhaps a supervisor's moved to another part of the country and is not available, so it's hard to reach them, but then generally it's filled out by someone else in the agency. It doesn't necessarily have to be the immediate supervisor who supervised the person at the time of injury. That's preferable, but it doesn't have to be that person. So it could be someone in HR, it could be the supervisor's supervisor or the new supervisor. Yeah. So we each, have each agency will have their own standard operating procedure on how they deal with uh, workers' comp cases. Right. Um, if that immediate supervisor is not helpful, perhaps go to your HR, you go to your injury comp specialist, right. or you go to uh, someone else in your agency to find out what the procedure is. There's definitely someone in every agency in place with knowledge of workers' comp that should be able to help them. Okay, another question. You indicated that the expense, that if the expense exceeds $1,500, the case would automatically flip and be opened. Yes. What we have seen in our district is that the case goes from automatic closure to underdevelopment, even though the case had been originally accepted. Why? Well, the case was never originally accepted. What it was was administratively approved for medical bills under $1,500. If that goes over and it flips open and we have the medical evidence in file that shows that they were injured in the performance of duty and we have the causal relationship from a physician indicating that their diagnosis is related to what happened, then we'd be able to accept the case immediately. However, once it opens up and we don't have that evidence, we need to undertake the development necessary in order to get the evidence we need to accept the case formally. Right. So there's a couple of things there. One is our own particular lingo and flip to us means go from this sort of administratively accepted to a regular open but not accepted case. 
the assumption for these short-form closures is that these are going to be very minor injuries, as Josh said. And so someone will go to the doctor, maybe get a couple of prescriptions, have a follow-up, and return to work with no wage loss. Those are so minor that we don't review them. We just pay the medical bills, and that's the status quo. However, sometimes in the door, it seems like it's a very minor injury. Someone may have said, I tripped and fell and sprained my ankle, and we thought that's all there was to it. But it turns out they tore ligaments and ended up needing a surgery. Well, as the medical bills go over that threshold, that's a signal to us that the case is more serious than we realized and that we really do need to undergo the normal development procedures. So it then reverts back to the same status it would have been had we not done this administrative acceptance and we do all the normal development. So there's no penalty or it's not treated any differently. It's just instead of just flying under the wire because we think it's minor, it's now been called to our attention that it's a little bit more serious. Okay. Uh, another, there's another couple of questions on COP. The next one is from a VA hospital, and they would like to know, should we pay COP without medical? They have 10 days to provide the medical, correct? They are correct. You're the, it is the burden of the claimant to supply medical for COP. The agency does have the right not to pay it if the claimant refuses to provide medical. Uh, you can't walk in and say, I hurt myself, and fill out a form, and then just sit back and wait to get paid for 45 days. So yes, they do have the right to do that. But they also should try to pursue it with the claimant to try to get the medical from them, as opposed to just laying in wait, because the person may not realize. They may be sending things to us and not sending it directly to the employer. Okay. And the next one is, what should an agency do if the claimant brings in medical that states that they need to be off work for two days? For example, Friday and Saturday, where Saturday is not a normal work day for the employee. The employee then would like to use another day, like the following Monday. Can they do that, or should the two-day excuse be for the Friday and Saturday that was given? I think if they have a medical note disabling them for work for uh, Friday and Saturday, that they should return to work on that Monday. They're going to be cleared to return to work uh, as of that date, and that's the date that we're going to consider them uh, back, back healthy. And I agree. The, the physician gave specific dates. They said two days off of work. And those are the two days that should be covered. If it happens to be on their work shift, then they stay off. If it's not on their work shift, then they don't. We would generally not pay compensation if the medical does not cover the specific days. All right. I think a last one on COP. Can the employee use COP for medical appointments after the 45 days? So COP gets very complicated. And I'm not surprised we're getting lots of questions. And if you look at the, C the slides in total, we probably have more slides on COP than anything else. That's why I asked Josh to do it instead of me. Um, it gets very complicated. 45 days is not an absolute. It's not within just a 45-day window. It, if they go back to work, but they continue to miss some time for medical appointments, it can stretch out 45 up to so many days after the first return to work. Up to 90 days after the first return to work. Yeah, exactly right. So when, as I said at the outset, this is normally an eight-hour class. We would literally spend a half an hour to 45 minutes just on COP. It's very complicated. What I would encourage you to do if you have questions about COP and you're not sure how to calculate it is either contact the injury compensation person or try to contact us directly. If you have no joy, you have our contact information here, and we'll put you in touch with someone who can help you. It's not impossible to figure out, but it, there's a lot of little rules that make it very complicated. So it, just remember, it's not always an absolute 45 days. So a direct answer to the question is, yes, they can use it for a medical appointment after that first 45 days, but it depends on when they first return to work. Any others? It looks kind of complicated, <laughs> but I'll read it. <laughs> okay. If an employee who has been out due to medical using her own leave submits a CA-1 after more than 45 days of the date of injury, can she request to change her own leave to COP for the first 45 days and DOL make the determination if no longer 30, entitled right? due to the fact that the notification was submitted more than 30 days? Or at this point, can we inform the employee that it, they are not eligible for COP? You'd be able to inform the employee they're not eligible for COP because they need to submit the claim uh, on the form within 30 days of the date of injury. And in this situation, it sounds like they waited till after 45 days in order to submit that form so they wouldn't be eligible for the COP. Everything else would still be adjudicated. It would still go forward. But just in terms of payment of COP, they would not award them COP for that period. If later the case was accepted, they'd be able to file a claim for wage loss and 
uh, if the agency agrees to it, they can buy back the leave used for any accepted condition. Correct. And that's at the agency's discretion, whether they allow the injured employees to do that. Okay, so I'm gonna continue with occupational disease, which is uh, the form CA2. So an occupational disease is a condition attributed to exposure to work factors over a period longer than one week, I mean one work day or shift. So we see, um, we see a lot of carpal tunnel syndrome, CA2 cases for people that have been typing for many years of their life. We see orthopedic injuries for you know, postal people who have done a lot of walking during their career. We see hearing loss cases for people who have been around airlines or uh, gunfire. Those are the types of occupational disease. Also included in that are maybe uh, long-term stress cases. So as I mentioned before, the COP is not provided, and the CA-16 is also not issued. So COP and CA-16 only go in conjunction with your CA-1, your notice of traumatic injury. If you think about that, it kind of makes sense. The CA-1 is something that happens suddenly to people, and they're unexpected and unawares. The CA-2 is a more long-term thing, that they, they know this has been going on. When they file the claim, it's not a surprise. They'll generally have their leave where they know some, a little more planning can go on, so they're not going to suffer nearly the hardship, and that's why COP is not as critical. So the CA-2, it must be submitted to the employing agency within three years from when the employee became aware or reasonably should have been aware of a possible relationship between the medical condition and the employment uh, or the date of last exposure. So you can have someone who went to the doctor because their wrists were hurting, and the doctor said, you may have, uh, you may have carpal tunnels. They're like, okay, I'll just monitor it over the next year or so, and they continue working. Then a year down the road, they're like, well, this is not getting better. I think I need to file a claim. That would be timely because they first really became reasonably aware of it a, a year before. And the CA-2 needs to be transmitted to OWCP, just like the CA-1, within 10 work days from the date the agency received the notice. And the do not hold we put there, we really emphasize that, really for all of our forms, but especially for the claims forms. We, we rely heavily on nurses to, work, to help us with work the cases, and the sooner they get out to the claimant and help us manage the claim, working with the doctor, the claimant, the sooner we get these people back to work. It really helps everyone, the faster we move early in the claim. So please, try not to hold on to these. Um, right. So the CA2 adjudication, OWCP tries to adjudicate occupational disease claims within uh, 90 days for a simple OD, uh, like your carpal tunnel syndrome, your orthopedic conditions, or 180 days for extended ODs, and that's your stress cases, your pulmonary conditions, um, if there's any eye loss or sight loss. Uh, types of cases like that take a longer development because we might need to go out and schedule uh, additional medical exams before we can make a determination on any benefits. Uh, here's a, a slide about death benefits and how they would be paid out to a widow, to any surviving dependent children. Um, so if someone does die as a result of a workplace injury, their widow would be entitled to 50% uh, of the compensation. If there's a child, an eligible dependent, and that could be someone who's uh, below 18 or someone who, uh, there's, a, there's a number of different, different rules for eligible dependents. But they, uh, the widow's percentage would decrease to 45%, and each additional child would get 15% for a maximum of 75%. Yes? Not generally. Generally, it's those immediate survivors, unless he had a dependent. So it would not necessarily have to be a spouse or a child, but if he was supporting someone, a grandchild, uh, a cousin, an aunt, that could be covered. But it's generally only those that are dependents to the deceased federal employee. So there are, are no burial expenses. So repeat the question, please, the people on the... Oh, I'm sorry. So she was asking if, in a, if a federal worker dies during the performance of their federal duties but have no dependents, are there any benefits payable? Um, yes, we do pay a death benefit, a uh, death and burial expense benefit. Um, I'm not sure that I've seen one when there isn't a dependent to file the claim, so I'm not 
I'm a little unclear on that. I'm so Sometimes afraid. we would receive the bills directly from the funeral home, and I think there's a $200 burial expense that would be paid. And there's also a benefit sometimes that's paid to the agency for the administrative cost to uh, formally close the paperwork, as they say, on the person. But outside of that, there's really no, unless they have an eligible dependent, there won't be any monetary compensation uh, paid because there's no one there to actually pay it to. Right. Is that good? Okay. Um, so medical benefits, OWCP authorizes medical services, appliances, or supplies that are likely to cure, give relief, reduce the degree or period of disability, or aid in lessening the amount of the monthly compensation. So if, so if a claimant wants to send in any authorization for any medical treatment that's related to an accepted condition, um, and they have the medical evidence from a doctor indicating that this type of treatment will make them better, then we will authorize that. The key thing is that we authorize medical treatment that's related to the accepted condition, and that will help cure or give relief to that person. And any qualified physician or hospital can provide such services, appliances, or supplies. Uh, the CA-16. I mentioned it before, which is issued with the CA-1. It shall be issued within four hours of the claimed injury. It's, uh, if verbal authorization is given, it needs to be issued within 48 hours. It's not required to issue more than one week after the date of the injury. Because what the CA-16 does is it gives us a medical snapshot of the person's condition at the time they had their injury. So after a week has passed, uh, we're not going to be able to know the you know, the contemporaneous symptoms of what their injury was at that time. And it should not be issued for occupational disease claims, which I think I hammered home. Uh, I'm gonna turn it back to Jay for the next part. Okay, great. Yes. So the question is, what can the employing agency do if the employee is seeing more than one doctor for treatment? We generally only recognize one treating physician. Now, they may have a treating physician, they may have a physical therapist, there may be other things they're seeing doctors for, they may have multiple conditions. So you may have an orthopedist seeing them for their knee, while at the same time an allergist seeing them for some allergic condition. But if it's the same condition, we would only pay for a single treating physician to see them for that condition. In other words, they don't go to two doctors and pick whichever one they like better. Well, we have some, yeah, some claims that doctors are. Correct. That, that, well, we, Right, so what she was following up with was the time-honored practice of doctor shopping, what's called doctor shopping. And you do have some claimants that may go to another doctor to get a more favorable opinion. Once they've established a treating physician in a case, they actually have to request from us to change that physician. All claimants have the right to pick their own treating physician. It's in the act. We do not have the right to tell them who they may see, or who they must see, I should say. So they could pick the doctor, whoever they want. But after that point, in order for them to change to a new treating physician, they have to ask permission of us, and we have to grant that permission. There has to be a reason. The reason can't be, he's making me go back to work and I don't want to, which is sometimes the reason. So that's when you get sort of some of that going on. It's some of that sort of thing is going to happen. It's hard to stop it in its entirety, but that's a little bit of that is on us because we should be looking at the medical evidence in the case and developing the case before it gets to that point with any luck. And if we do miss it, definitely reach out to the claims examiner handling the case and bring it to their attention so they can look into it. Okay. Okay. All right, so now we're gonna talk about wage loss, which may get a little more interest with folks um, because this is where sort of it hits the wallet. <sighs> The difficulty we have, it's very similar to what OPM has to go through, is we have to be expert in all types of pay systems. We have to try to pay federal employees pretty much, un although under our rules, exactly as they are paid. Now that sounds fairly simple because you sort of assume everyone's on the GS scale and works 40 hours a week, but that's absolutely not the case. You have postal workers. We've got seasonal workers, say, who work for the Forest Service. There's temporary workers, perhaps for the census, intermittent workers. All of them have different rules for all the various premium pays and overtime pays that they get, and we have to learn all of them. So it makes our job a lot more complicated. 
it gets back to what I was saying earlier. That's why we rely so heavily on you guys to give us the correct information because the only way we can do is calculate it based on what you're telling us. We don't always know all the ins and outs of what that particular employee might get. You may know that a rural letter carrier only works a certain fixed schedule by definition, but we may not know that. And so we rely on the employer to tell us exactly what their schedule is and exactly what their pay is. So towards that. In order to file a claim, they have to file a CA-7. Like all the forms, please get it in quickly. Nothing will make a claimant more upset or make them less willing to return to work than not getting paid. We try to pay claims as quickly as possible. In my opinion, that's what we are here to do, is to pay the federal worker who is injured, who cannot earn a salary because they may not have a safety net to fall on. But the CA-7 is the form that we use to do that. The claimant, just like the CA-1 and 2, the claimant fills out the front and the agency fills out the back of the form. Again, uh, we have time frames for this and we measure the agencies. The, the statistics are published on our website and it's all set by regulation. The agencies have five working days from the receipt of the, by the employee to submit that form to us. We're doing more and more electronic filings which helps the agency meet their timeliness guidelines and it helps us because we get the information quicker. It works for everyone all around, it's a general rule. And we, under, for our own part, when we receive that within the five days, we are to take action within 14 days. I would say for the most part we meet that standard quite in the high 90s, I believe, in the high 90 percentile for the sort of CA-7 forms filed. <laughs> Moving on. So pay rates. In order to pay someone, we have to establish their pay rate. There's three different ways of doing it for us. It could be on the claimant's date of injury. It could be when the, the date disability began. They could have been injured, say, on the January 1st, but they didn't take off right away. They waited a few weeks before they decided they filed a claim and then they took off. So disability could be later. It could be the date of recurrence. If they'd returned to work for at least six months and then were injured again, they would be entitled to a new pay rate. Regardless of the one that we use, we always pay whichever rate is greater. That is by, by the regulation. We calculate a weekly pay rate for disability claims. For death claims, it's based on a monthly pay rate which is really more for our purposes than yours, but it explains why you'll see that in things that we send out, in disability claims, we'll talk about the weekly pay and we always talk about monthly pay and death claims. Now, we had the three types of pay rate. In addition, here's a laundry list of all the various things that we have to think about or include depending on what the, uh, where the federal worker works that are also part of pay. As you can see, it's a lot of stuff. And depending on what the person does, one agency may have all of these different things, but depending on the actual job. So if you take this and then add in the factor of the three different pay types, it ends up being a lot. There are specific elements that are excluded from pay. Overtime, uh, locality or COLA pay, bonus or premiums. A lot of these things per diem in travel. A lot of these things, they're, it's sort of intuitive. Someone's not going to be working overtime if they're injured. We'll pay them their base pay. They may have counted on overtime unless it's and what is it called, administratively uncontrolled overtime, which is a set by law figure for certain, usually law enforcement officers. Uh, that will be a, a specific element of pay. But otherwise, if he just happened to been, for the last couple of weeks, working some overtime and got paid for that, we wouldn't include it in regular pay. In order to determine the pay rate, we have to look at their entitlement. Entitlement, the basic entitlement to workers' compensation is 66 and two-thirds percent, or two-thirds of their regular wages. If they have dependents, it's three-quarters, 75 percent. Bear in mind that our benefits are tax-free. So because we don't fool around with FICA and on state taxes and local taxes and whatnot, the Act contemplates that this reduction will basically offset the taxes that the claimant has to pay. Uh, period of entitlement, we talked about COP, which the agencies pay. After the COP period is over, there's a waiting days period of three days. If the employee is disabled for less than 14 days after COP, then there's a three-day waiting period in which they're not paid compensation, they're expected to use their own leave. Any questions so far? I had a feeling. <laughs> okay, one of them is, why is the CA-7 timeliness under the power initiative counted based on the date the employee signed the form and not when it was received by the agency? You want to address it? You want me to? 
I mean, because the, the, at the end of the day, we're concerned with the, for, the injured worker. We want the agencies to perform well, but we want to make sure that the, when the worker signs it and hands it in, that the agency is submitting it quickly and timely. Uh, the agencies have a problem with this because we do are told that the worker signs it on Monday, but he didn't hand the form in until Thursday, and now we're already going to be late. And we're aware of this, but I don't know that it's a substantial problem. The timeliness goal is actually when the, it's not when the employee signs the form, because the employee can, like you said, sign the form on a Friday and then give it to the agency on a Monday, and then that puts the agency at a disadvantage by three days. It's when the agency receives the form, that's when the clock starts. So they need to submit that form within five days from the date they receive it. There you go. Okay, next question. What happens if a claimant sends the form CA-7 directly to OGWCP without having the ICPA complete the back portion? It's going to be the same thing that, uh, that Jay mentioned before, like the CA-1 or 2. Our case grade facility is told that if we receive a CA-7 with the back incomplete, that's going to be returned to the uh, filer. And there's also a checklist that's added to it indicating why it's being returned. So they're going to check off that the agency did not complete their part and they're gonna return it directly, for the, uh, directly to the injured employee for them to submit to their agency. Okay. The next one is about a uh, medical question. If the employee selected a primary doctor and also saw a physical therapist, the physical therapist said the employee has reached MMI. Mm -hmm. This was not the primary doctor. I should advise the employee to have the primary doctor state this, correct? Correct. So yeah, as any federal agency, we're no slouch at acronyms. MMI stands for Maximum Medical Improvement. The physical therapist is not a physician. So they're there to render treatment and perhaps give us reports on the treatment, but it's the opinion of the treating physician that matters in this case. So yes, the, the, their guess is absolutely correct. Even though the physical therapist might think they've reached MMI, that's probably only for the condition that they're doing physical therapy for, and there could be other factors in the case that they know nothing about. We would then, even if we saw it, we would refer to the treating physician and ask them to give us a report stating whether or not the claimant has reached MMI and reasons why or why not. Yeah, and the agency has a regulatory right to correspond with employees um, treating physicians in writing at reasonable intervals. So if the agency becomes aware that the physical therapist says that this person is better, they can take that physical therapy report uh, create a statement and send that to the treating physician themselves and ask them to comment on whether or not this person can return to work or if there's any restrictions. But that should only be done in writing and at reasonable intervals. Another question about the CA-7. I know the DLL pays out monthly from the CA-7. However, when a person is on extended period of time, should they submit the CA-7 bi-weekly or monthly? Well, if, if, someone, if, if there's an ex expectation of extended disability, we use what we call the periodic roll, and we pay someone every 28 days, which is basically just twice a normal pay period, and a CA-7 is not required at that point. So it kind of depends on the factors in the case. If the doctor is telling us, Mr. Smith will return to work in two weeks, well, there's no sense in someone submitting a claim for months. We're not going to put them on the periodic roll and keep them on for months if we think there's a chance they'll be back to work relatively quickly. However, if we're told he's about to go out for back surgery and he's expected to be out for four months, well, at that point, we would put them on the rolls and then they wouldn't need to file the form. So it kind of depends. It is sort of on a case-by-case -case basis depending on the injury of the claimant and the circumstance. As a general rule, most tend to file them biweekly because that's what the pay that they're used to getting and then so it's not long periods of time with or without pay. Another question on pay. Firefighters normally work 144-hour tour of duty and are paid standby pay. Is this included in their workers' comp pay? It's yes, but it's complicated. FLSA pay, it, not FLSA, I'm sorry. The, the firefighter pay is very complicated, so I'm not going to even attempt it here at this stage. But yes, there is, there is a contemplation to that when we calculate their pay rates. If you have lot, specific questions about that, please email us. Yeah, a lot of the time in situations like that, we can look at what their previous year salary was and you know, divide that by 26 or divide that by 52 and then have a weekly salary based on that. Right. But the firefighter pay is definitely a different kind right. of calculation that, um, that gets a little more into the weeds that we would, uh, we would work with anyone if they have specific questions. Yeah, it gets that. back to what I said before. It's one of those very unique circumstances because they get paid basically to be sitting around waiting in case they have to go fight a fire. 
there, there's a certain factor that's used to apply to do that, but it's very, it's very complicated. And so if they have questions and they're not sure that we're calculating it correctly, please email us and we'll go ahead and, and investigate for you. Oh, ma'am, you had a question in the audience. Yes. Okay. I work on the side of retirement, and it, it, it's, um, how can I put it nicely? It's very time consuming when a person has been on workers' compensation, and then they decide, oh, I want to retire. I can give you an example of, I just <coughs> um, did a retirement case for a gentleman. He was on workers' compensation, and then he decided, oh, I'd rather go ahead and retire instead. Mm -hmm. But he didn't inform all the, um, and agency, he didn't inform the agency, right. um, as well as workers' compensation at the same time that he was doing this. So workers' compensation was steady paying him while he had filed his application for retirement. And so OPM placed him in interim pay, and he was still getting his OWCP payments. Right. And he said he did not know the rules, was not informed, was not counseled, or all these um, you know, a miscommunication. And so I had to deal with um, letting him know that he's eligible to retire, but um, he's been overpaid now from workers' compensation. Mm -hmm. Workers' compensation is stating that um, this gentleman was counseled. And so I'm finding that um, I deal with the civil service side, but I'm finding with the FERS, which is the new retirement system, that um, it's a huge miscommunication, lack of information of um, the paperwork as far as receiving the termination letters. There's a major breakdown in the communication between the documents that's supposed to come over from OWCP to OPM. And I was just trying to figure out how they can bridge the gaps between the two agencies so that there's not, so we can avoid some of these major delays that we have because you can work under FERS only 18 months, and then most of the retirement under FERS are disabilities. Mm -hmm. So we have hundreds of thousands, if not thousands of cases of missing information in order to properly retire these people under a disability. That's for FERS. Civil service, um, we have a little bit of leeway, but I just wanted to find out, is there some way we can address bridging those gaps well, I mean, we're always, I work frequently with OPM, so we're always interested in any suggestions you might have to make that better. We do inform the claimants in the acceptance letters. We issue a, what's called a 10-month letter when we've been paying them for 10 months that warns them what will happen if they continue on disability. They might, they might lose their, they may not have a retirement entitlement. We send them a form every year called the 1032 that asks them specifically if they're receiving funds from OPM or if they even have a CSA number. Um, we have our agency query system, which is an online query system, which I know OPM uses extensively. Um, I, I can't speak for here, but I know at The Rock, they, they tend to use that to look up a case before they start paying, just to see if it's in a pay status with us. Uh, we work back and forth as best we can. Of course, there's always ways to improve, I'm sure. But we try to communicate with the claimants as much as we can to warn them that we're not retirement. They kind of think sometimes that we are. And so since they think we are, they think it's no big deal if they go get another retirement. But we explain to them that we're not. We're wage loss. And you can't be getting wage loss and retirement at the same time. You can in certain circumstances, which I'll talk about. But for the most part, you can't. So again, you have the contact information. If you have some ideas, I'd be happy to hear them. But there is always going to be some kind of gap because people will not pay attention to the things that we send them. But just just for, you, just for you to understand our procedures too, when we receive notice that someone has filed for uh, disability through OP, I mean, retirement through OPM, our claims examiner should be um, issuing an election letter mm -hmm. to the uh, injured employee where they can elect benefits between either OWCP or OPM. And at that time, they should also stop the, uh, stop the compensation because they received notice that OPM might be paying them. So, I don't want to, I don't know the specifics of the case you're speaking of, but you know, we're always, we're always requesting input from OPM and from other agencies about you know, what they see. 
And these are things that we could always bring back to our claims examiners to make sure that they're, they're following procedures. And you have the same problem we do. You don't know what you don't know. Well, we're bound by the rules of the act. So the act tells us if there's even one percent disability for someone, that we have to honor that. And as people get, what the problem we have is that when people get older and they have other disabling conditions, if she did any kind of physical work, like say was a letter carrier forty years ago, and has all these other conditions that aren't work related, but has that even small percentage of work related condition, we can't return her to work. And in her 80s, no one else is going to offer her a job. So at a certain point, we have that person unless they decide to volunteer. We can't say, I'm sorry, you're too old. You wouldn't be working anyway, so we're going to cut you off. We don't have the right. We have to find them either completely healed, so to speak, or find them a job. And it is very difficult for us. Now, we've done several long-term projects on what we call our periodic roles. These cases have been on for a very long time. And that number has shrunk dramatically in my tenure with, with OWCP. So there are still cases that come out, but there are fewer and fewer of those. I'm sorry, I'm going to move along a little bit because we do are limited in time and there's still quite a bit to, more to get through. So wage loss deductions. Um, there's only certain things that we take from, from wage loss uh, that we're allowed to. Uh, you know, you could, the general list, you can see um, health benefits, life insurance. For postal workers, we do honor the postal rate for health benefits within the first year of disability. After a year, it's assumed that they're no longer going to be postal employees so that they get the postal rate deducted at the usual rate. We also, as I said, life insurance, dental vision, and we would take spousal and child support. But that is all. We, there, if someone has a judgment against them in court and they've been getting $500 taken from their paycheck by court order, we will not honor that. The act is very specific that the, judge, the payments cannot be attached for any reasons except those specific ones outlined in that slide. And it's also important to note we're not deducting for TSP or retirement benefits right. also because you're in a leave without pay status. So it might not go towards your time and service and it's also not going to go towards your uh, thrift savings plan. Correct. So flexible spending, long-term care, those things are not deducted. Taxes are the big one that people don't necessarily understand. I get a call every year, at least a few, in March or April. I need to file my taxes. You haven't sent me a W-2. It's a tax-free benefit. There will be no W-2. Uh, leave buyback, Josh mentioned earlier. This is when an employee has used their annual or sick leave to cover their workers' compensation time. They can buy that leave back. It is at the discretion of the agency. So the agency can say no, they don't want to do leave buybacks. They don't even need to provide a reason. There's no regulatory, it's purely an optional program. I will say most agencies do it, um, and it can be on a case-by-case -case basis. It really is at the discretion of the agency. I have seen claims where someone's come back and said, I used sick leave 30 years ago and I'd like to buy it back now because they're getting ready to retire and they want to add on to their service time. And the agency said, I'm sorry, we can't access, no, we can't access those records. It's just too far back. They have the right to do that. When the employee does the leave buyback, they almost always will owe us some money because again, we haven't deducted for taxes and Medicare and things like that. So they have to make up that difference from what the regular paycheck would be. So there's always some payment. So frequently we get claims filed, they wanna do it and then they're told by the agency, well, that's great, but you have to pay this and then they don't wanna do it anymore. But if they follow through and they pay back the agency, the leave is fully restored however many hours that they used. We also provide a cost of living increase it's not the same one that federal employees get. Uh, we base our starts on March 1st of every year. In order for a claimant to be eligible for it, they have to be on the rolls for one year as of March 1st. Ours is uh, similar to what Social Security does in that we use sort of wage statistics to come up with what the average cost is. We use December as a base month instead of a quarter like Social Security does. But it's basically what wage an hour tells us is the cost, no, I'm sorry, not wage an hour, BLS tells us is the cost increase from year to year in December, and then we apply it the following March. 
Termination, so we've talked through all the pay elements, now we have termination of wage loss. Once we've accepted the claim, the burden now becomes upon us to terminate a claim. We can't just say you haven't submitted anything anymore, so we're gonna terminate your payment. We may suspend benefits if someone's not complying or submitting medical or things like that, but we can't terminate a claim unless we actually are proactive and go forward and show evidence that the claim should no longer be accepted. Um, we frequently will terminate wage loss compensation, stop paying them. However, medical benefits will continue if there's any residuals of the injury. Someone could still have residuals of their carpal tunnel condition, but it's so minor that they can still work without any work restrictions, so we expect them to return to work. Also, entitlement to FEHB and life insurance stops with any wage loss stoppage. So unless we're paying them something, we cannot cover them for FEHB or life insurance. Some other reasons other than a, a resolution of the condition to terminate wage loss, if there's a fraud conviction, if they refuse suitable employment, if the employing agency has offered them a job that fits within whatever restrictions they may have, and we find it suitable, but yet they refuse to return to work, then we would terminate their compensation. Obviously, if the injury resolves, or if we've determined that there's just, the, they have no loss of wage earning capacity. Schedule awards. Schedule awards are a benefit that we would pay in addition, separate than wage loss, though paid similarly to wage loss, that compensates someone for a permanent partial loss of use of whatever the affected member is. This is the benefit that they can get at the same time while they're getting paid by OPM. And frequently what our claimants do is when they're getting their schedule award, they elect disability retirement with OPM and they get paid by OPM and they get our award. And when the schedule award runs out, they come back to us. There's no limitation on electing back and forth between OPM and OWCP. It's not a one-time irrevocable election. They can literally go back and forth. This, this is used, uh, the sixth guide of the AMA is used to establish this. It's paid based, just like compensation, it's based on days or weeks of loss. The permanent use percentage is translated into the days and weeks of loss, which I'll show you in a second. And then that is an award. It can also be paid in a lump sum if the person elects to have it. And if they do that, we do sort of a reduction, just like the lottery does. When you hear someone wins 250 million, but then they get the actual check and it's only like 189 million, it's because there's that sort of actuarial reduction, we do the same sort of thing. Um, of note is after 9-11, skin was added as a member, so if someone gets a severe burn, they get more fairly compensated than they had been in the past. Oh, and there was also a question before it started about this, about schedule awards. If the claimant is having a hard time getting his or her physician to do the evaluation that we need for a schedule award, they should contact the district office and we can arrange a medical exam for them so that they can get the evaluation done and receive their schedule award. This chart shows you the, the maximum number of weeks that they can get for a total loss of use of the various body parts. So if you were to lose all, say, either through some sort of injury or amputation of a thumb, for example, that would translate to 75 weeks of compensation. Okay, dual benefits. These are prohibited dual benefits. Things that you can't get paid for by another agency while being paid by us. I put OPM right at the top. <laughs> so your question was timely. <laughs> but as a general, yes, you can't get retirement and workers' compensation at the same time. It, with the exception of the scheduled award example, that is entitled. Um, you have a VA disability for the same injury for retirement. There's various other things that are here. Actually, these are allowable dual benefits, I believe. I think I've got it backwards. I think these are allowable dual benefits. You can have a death benefit or a lump sum payment and get, still get paid by OPM. They can have a VA disability for a different injury and still get paid by us. It's by the same injury that's not allowable. And elections between OWCP and OPM. So again, the claimant has the right to elect back and forth. Um, we see this frequently. If we're about to return someone to work and they don't like it and they don't want to, they say they're going to go retire, and that's fine. They can do that, but we'll still continue to do what we're supposed to do and find that they're suitable for employment so that they can't come back to us. The scheduled award example happens frequently where people can go back and forth. It all depends on the case. But there's no regulation between the two that allows them to pick one or the other. It makes things very complicated for OPM and OWCP, but it's perfectly allowable. So return to work. 
This is where we count on the, again, we count on the th things we're counting on the agencies to do to help us get the claimant back to work. Because we can say the condition's resolved, but if there's no work, we still have to pay them. So we try to return them wherever possible to the employing agency back to their date of injury job, if possible. If there's some restrictions, we work with the employing agency to try to get those restrictions accommodated so that if need be, they can do light duty work but get back to work and be productive and not be paid to stay at home on total disability. The general premise is the OPM restoration rights. After a year, 365 days of leave without pay, the agency has the right to separate the claimant and they're no longer on their employee roles and we have well and truly inherited them. At that point, we may still come back to you two years later and ask you if you have a job for this person, but they don't have the same priority consideration they would for the first year. Within the first year, they have a priority consideration to be returned back to work. Um, let's see, cover that. Though we want to return them, and the doctor may say they can return, the claimant may not necessarily agree with us. So there are some acceptable reasons to refuse a return to work. The position is withdrawn is a common one. Um, sometimes a person returns on light duty, and then the agency no longer has the light duty assignment available anymore. If they withdraw the light duty, they return to us for total disability until another position can be found for them. These have to be formal positions. They can't be what we call make work positions, where you say, oh, don't worry, I'll find something for them to do. They have to be literally regular PDs written up with regular work descriptions where there's an actual SF50 cut that says, here is this person's title, grade, step, and the, and the duties they're going to perform. Um, clearly, medical evidence established that the condition's gotten worse or they can't perform the duty or even from doing the light duty has caused them to have difficulties and so it's not appropriate anymore for them to work. Things along these lines are reasonable reasons for someone to refuse it. The physician, we can give them a light duty job offer and their physician can review it and say, I don't believe that they can perform those restrictions. This doesn't fit with what I've told you that they can do. That would be acceptable as well. We would have to make a decision on that or perhaps send them out for a medical exam to determine if that was true. On the flip side, there are a lot of unacceptable reasons not to do that. Preference for the area in which they currently reside. We will have people who've been on the rolls for some time decide that they were retired and moved to Florida. And then we give them a job offer back, let's say they lived in Wichita and we said, they have a job for you now in Wichita and you're expected to report. And they will say, I live in Florida now, so I'd like a job in Florida. Well, if the agency offers them one in Florida, that's fantastic, but they're not obliged to. So if the claimant decides to move for other than medical reasons, now we do get claimants that do move because they have health reasons. Specifically, we get a lot of pulmonary breathing conditions where the doctor says, literally like the old cliche, they should be living in the desert because the air is better for them. In that case, then we would accommodate that and we would consider that as a reasonable move. But otherwise, if a job offer is made and the person just simply decided to move to somewhere else, they've done that by their own choice. It would not affect the decisions we make. They can't say they don't like the work hours. They can't say they don't think it's gonna give them enough of a promotion, et cetera, et cetera. Those things do not fit as, a, as an acceptable reason not to accept a job offer. Vocational rehabilitation. So we've gone to the agency, we've paid the person for their claim, their condition has gotten better, we've gone to the agency, we've got some restrictions, everything looks great, but the agency can't accommodate them, but we wanna return them to work. So we go to our, our last vestige of hope, which is vocational rehabilitation. And we have vocational rehabilitation programs to try to return people back to the workforce. Wherever possible, we try to return them back to the federal workforce. But in this day and age, with smaller budgets and shrinking federal workforces, it gets harder and harder to do to find a federal job. So quite often we end up putting them in the private sector. It just depends on the case and the kind of work that they can do and the restrictions that they have. Um, the voc rehab counselor will take into consideration the medical restrictions a person has, whatever education they may or training they might have. They do some testing to see what abilities they have and they try to place them with a job that not only is suitable to them, but that also that they're ad <clears throat> excuse me, adequate jobs in their area so that they can find a job. We don't want to set them up to fail. So we try to train them into something where they can actually get a job down in the future. They also work with them in the, completely through the training process and in the placement with the new employer. Once all that's completed, the person's returned to work, we would do what's called a loss of wage earning capacity. We would do a decision to see if they've lost any wages if we've returned them to work, but they're only working, say, half time, but for the same wages, and it doesn't look like that's going to change, then we would pay them for the lost wages that they had in comparison to what they were making when they, before that they were injured. 
So that's a typical sort of thing, especially if they return back to their federal employer. The doctor may say they're only going to be able to work six hours a day because of their condition. They just become too tired or their legs hurt or whatever the reason may be. So they're only going to work six hour shifts in order to make up those last two hours a day. We would pay them compensation for that on a formal decision. And lastly is appeal rights. This applies to any decision, not only the wage earning capacity that I just spoke of, but any decision, decision, decision to terminate. Any adverse decision always comes with appeal rights from us. Um, there's three basic types. The hearing, there could be a phone hearing. We do online hearings. And then there's also a, a sort of WebEx, and then there's a review of the written record. This is all done by our branch of hearings and review. The claimant can also request a reconsideration where someone in the district office who's never looked at the case before reviews all the evidence of the case and then renders an opinion on the decision. And then lastly, they can go before the Employees Compensation Appeals Board, should they choose, which is kind of like our Supreme Court. They issue decisions on cases and they can kind of set case law and precedent that may change the way our procedures work based on their decisions. Any questions? Quiet on the laptop front. There's a couple. Okay, here's one about what you were just talking about. If an agency makes a job offer to an employee and it is found suitable, however, the employee cannot report to work because they have been banned from the work site for another reason, is compensation paid or denied? Wow. You guys are really stretching me today. That's... <laughs> I'm going to guess that that would, I, I, I'd have to look into that. I'm going to guess that no, because that would not be something that we would consider. We'd probably work with them to try to get them to make a job offer at a different location, not the place that they're banned. I would um, wonder why the agency is making a job offer to someone that they can't have yeah, around. Yeah. <laughs> <that> just, <laughs> I've again, never seen that kind of again, situation Again, we, we try not to set people up to fail. We try to do it so that we can actually return them to work. So setting them up for somewhere where they can't go in the first place would not seem suitable. I have, think we'd have a hard time finding that suitable employment if they're not allowed to enter the premises. Next question. Can an employee be terminated from employment after one year and over 18 months of leave without pay? Yes, and the, and the rules in the previous slide are not our rules. Those are actually OPM's restoration right rules. At 365 days of LWAP, you can terminate an employee. That's just the rule. If we're paying, we'll continue to pay. It does not affect what OWCP does in that sense, but you are not obliged to keep them on your rolls. And I'll, I'll add an OPM message here. Please. That's why it's so important for agencies to have the person apply for retirement so that it can be suspended, so that they have the protection for their survivor and for health insurance later. They, they have to apply for retirement in order to have those protections. It can be suspended so they can pick up workers' comp. And because I don't see any of my Fegley friends in the audience, it also affects Fegley a lot because that's when they get their opportunity to elect post-retirement life insurance and some other forms that they need filled out and they get that opportunity to elect. What we see with our claimants a lot, especially when they stay on the rolls a long time, is they're never really properly separated or when the agency does separate, they don't inform them because it's been so long, they don't get the opportunity to elect these things and then years later, we try to figure out what they're entitled to and it's very difficult. Yes, ma'am, you had a question in the back. Right. Is that, is that not a suitable job then? Yeah, that would not be a suitable job because if he needs to sit in his car for an hour, uh, you have to take that into consideration, the driving things. You can specifically go back to the doctor and ask him about the driving right. restrictions to see if anything. But if we saw that, we would have to say that that would not be suitable because you have to take the transportation to and from work into consideration yeah. when the person returns to work. I, yeah, and I know it seems unfair because he was doing it before, but you have to think of it in the sense that his medical condition now, what's happened since the injury, has limited him to sitting for that long. And you certainly wouldn't expect him, if he's driving, say, to pull off on the side of the road you know, and, and do that. If he was taking Metro and he could sit and stand, maybe that's possible. If the person's... Right. And so if the person's motivated, they might try and do it. But we also don't want them to make their condition worse. 
because then they end up in total disability and you end up in a worse place than you were in the first place. But Josh has an excellent suggestion that sometimes you can go back to the doctor and the doctor can make alternate suggestions. Sometimes, depending on what the agency does, there's alternate work schedules. Now, OPM does mostly white collar, nine to five, maybe perhaps you can consider telework. Um, you could also consider a schedule where they start later. I've seen it frequently where someone would come in at 10 o'clock after commute time. So that what was normally an hour drive is now a 25 minute drive and the doctor says, well, an extra five minutes is probably okay. If the agency can accommodate that because there are hours that works, sometimes you have to be a little creative. You know, um, if, especially if the person's motivated and wants to get back to work, they'll generally work with you and try to get something done. So think outside the box a little bit, especially nowadays with telework being such a big thing. I mean, I would not shy away from that. I know it's, it's difficult, especially if someone's been off for a long time, to consider bringing them in, but they're still at home. But if you're getting production from someone and you're not paying them wage loss, instead you're paying them a salary to do work for you, that, that must be better. Others? We have a lot of questions, but they're not necessarily on this topic. Do you want to? Yeah, I think we, you want to just take, because the rest is sort of form sort of stuff. Do you want to take the questions now, or do you want to wait to the end? I'll we'll take the questions. OK. All right, um, one of them is, it just left. I understand a 10 month letter from CA 1032s annually go to the injured employee. Does the agency supervisor or human resources or injury comp professional receive a copy of these notifications as well? There's a lot of things mixed up in there. The 10 month letter is issued once when the claimant's been on the rolls for 10 months. So the idea is we're sending it just before a year, just before they're losing that restoration right. And it's basically saying, be careful, because if the agency separates you, it's gonna be much harder for you to get back to work. The 1032, we send every single year, as long as the person's still on our rolls. And that's asking a bunch of sort of employment related questions. Um, have you worked? Are you receiving VA benefits? Are you receiving OPM benefits? Do you still have dependents? Those sorts of things. As to copies of the documents, the agency can always request copies of the documents. We don't automatically send them, but they have the right to go see them. We also have our online, again, where the claims are filed, they can also go look at things online now where they send us a list and say, these are the cases we'd like to look at, and they can review the entire case online. Okay. Has there been any legislation passed that requires a compensation or to switch to retirement once they reach eligibility for a full unreduced annuity? No, FECA reform has been on the Hill for a couple of years now. It's tied to the postal bill, which you may have seen periodically in the news whenever they talk about ending Saturday delivery or closing a bunch of post offices. That's generally tied up with what they call the postal reform bill. The FECA reform bill is part of that as well, and that's just not been passed. That is one of the elements of it that we want to do is sort of, quote unquote, retire them at a certain age, but it's not been passed. All right, please explain how the agencies can actually use the documentation from the DOL file maintained at the agency's OWCP office to support removal of an employee after the one year mark has been reached. Isn't the employee's agency deemed as acting on behalf of the employer, not as a third party? and then define routine use. Okay, yeah. again, a lot of stuff in there. Okay, you don't need to support any, and you can chime in, you don't need to provide any evidence at 365 days. You can separate. There's no evidentiary requirement, so you certainly don't need our file to do that. Our file can only be used for something related to workers' compensation. So that would be, say, a return to work, um, a review of to, to see if the person's still disabled, if they're in a posture to return to work, medical restrictions, things like that. Any kind of personnel actions, any kind of, uh, say, a PIP, or any other problems, none of those things can you use any part of the workers' compensation file for that. And there was a third piece that I lost track of. I think she said something about routine use. Oh, and then the routine use. The, the, again, that's the basic routine use, which is on our website, which basically says it may only be used for purposes of workers' compensation and return to work. No other purpose whatsoever. That's why it has to be kept separately from the employee's regular personnel file because we don't want them mixed together. Their supervisor can't decide to go low. If you thought, if you were injured and it was something that maybe was a little personal to you, you wouldn't want your supervisor to just go rooting around and see what the doctor has to say about you. Your height, your weight, you know, your, your smoking, drinking, personal, have all that stuff just because they were nosy and felt like it. 
It's very sensitive information. So we keep that, we're very strict about keeping that far apart from any other part of the personnel actions. And in a lot of agencies, it's the same person who's dealing with the workers' comp side and the personnel side, because these are collateral duties. And even though that person has access to these files, it's kind of, they need to wear two separate hats. They need to first put on their workers' comp hat and use the documents for the reason that they were created, which is to manage uh, the workers' comp and to help return to work. And then if they need to take that hat off and look at the personnel side, they have to just have a selective memory about what they saw and not use those documents to make any personnel decisions. It's all governed under the Privacy Act and DOL Government One, which is, um, it's all described on our website if you wanna look at that, mm -hmm. um, about routine use. And I have a whole long routine use uh, presentation also, um, which I could share with anyone that wanted to reach out to me. Next one, when a CA-16 is issued, should the agency send a copy to DOL? If so, how should it be identified without a case number? Um, yeah, you can attach the CA-16 and send it with the uh, CA-1 at the same time to Central Case Create. Mm -hmm. Once it's sent in, we'll find, we'll find the person because the claim is going to be filed. The 16 is issued right away. The idea is that the person may or may not have health benefits, um, they might have difficulty if they tell, tell the hospital or doctor's office it's workers' comp, they may not want to bill Blue Cross for their services. That form is basically saying, here, take care of this person now. So we don't really care about a case number so much. As long as it's filled out properly and it gets back to us eventually, when we accept the case, they'll already have a case number, we use that to make sure that all those medical bills are paid. Even if we deny the case, the CA-16 will still pay the bills. This one is, how do you compute wage loss for volunteers and accompanying that is, how do you return a volunteer to work who has been approved for workers' compensation? <laughs> well, again, wage loss is wage loss. So volunteers would be difficult because they, they would have to demonstrate if there was other employment loss, but I don't think there is. So I'd have to see a specific example um, because there's only a limited number of volunteers that we actually accept benefits for. So I would ask whoever had the question to email me directly if they have a specific case example, and I'd be happy to research it for them. If you have a heart attack on work hours, is it a traumatic injury or an occupational disease? In the continuation of COP is paid and it is not found to be a traumatic injury, does the time have to be paid back? I would say a heart attack is a traumatic injury. That's something that's identifiable to an exact time, an exact place, an exact circumstance. So it's a CA-1, and um, if the person you know, lives through it, COP should be authorized through that uh, process. But to address the COP issue, just generally, if it's determined that COP was paid and it should not have been paid, so as Josh said earlier, you can controvert the COP and say, we don't think we should pay this, but you keep paying it until we give you a decision. When we give you a decision, say, you're right, you shouldn't be paying it. You then declare an overpayment to the employee, just like you would if you overpaid their, their salary. And then at that point, you recover it from the employee. So whether you garnish their check or whatever you would normally do, that's how you get the COP money back from, from the employee. Okay, next one. Um, is there a rapid process to provide workers' comp leave coverage for an employee who has a long time lingering effects from an injury? For example, an employee suffers a back injury and requires injections every 90 days or so and has for several years. This employee uses 30% of their normal leave because they have pain a couple of times a week from the injury and cannot work. Does this employee need a doctor's statement for every time they wake up in pain? If, that, if not, is there a way to administer a frequent reoccurrence like this? Correct. In order for us to pay wage loss, we have to have something from the doctor that says the person was disabled at that specific date and time for the specific work-related injury. So, yes, unfortunately. Especially if it's sporadic or intermittent like that. Yes, ma'am, at the back of the room. Speak up, please. <laughs> And it, it, it resulted in a, in a short paycheck. Um, can they recover the hours lost and be compensated if they have appointment documentation that's happened over a year, like 
they, sure. the, over a year, over two years. Right, yeah, so we don't have the same limitations. I came across this recently. We don't have the same limitations, say, the employing agencies do because we don't pay taxes. So I know sometimes it's difficult to adjust paychecks after a long period of time has passed because you have like the tax calculations and things like that. Those things don't affect us. So if it comes back to us that 10 years ago, the pay rate should have been $3 more, we will go back and recalculate it all the way back and repay the person whatever was not paid. Okay. So yes, as long as it's documented to us and the agency certifies that yes, that's correct, they should have had A, B, and C, then we would go back and repay it, yes. So as long as there's medical documentation saying on June 5th of 2012, you were at the doctor's office from 3 to 5 p.m., then they can get all of the time back. Well, okay, I'm sorry, I, I thought you were talking about the pay elements themselves. In terms of the medical, yes, there has to be medical, or the doctor wrote a note that said, or part of the report that says, I want him off of work this week, then we would certainly pay. We'd go back through the case file, that's mm -hmm. what we do with leave buybacks, right. is we have to go all the way back and look at the dates and see that there's medical for each and every date. Sometimes we pay some of it, and, some, and other parts we don't, because we say we don't have medical for these dates. And the claimant will go back to their doctor and say, well, can you send copies of the reports for those dates or the notes that show that I was there and that, that you had me disabled? Right. So we work with the, the claimant and the physician to try to get that established. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Are there other questions in the audience? Does that, does that matter how long the um, claimant has to go back to the doctor and talk to a year later? Common sense kind of prevails there. You know, you're going to have a hard time going to your doctor's office and say, do you remember 1978? <laughs> You know, they're only going to go back so far, and we have to have something. We can't just, if they get the information and give it to us, and we can determine that we haven't paid it, then we will go back and we will pay it. But we need some, we need documentation. Can you explain to me the difference between the reconsideration letters an employee will write as opposed to the appeals board? Uh, oh, a reconsideration is done within the district office. So generally, uh, a claims examiner, it, it, say a journey level claims examiner issues a decision and someone reviews it and signs off on it. If you file for a reconsideration, a senior claims examiner within the office who's never looked at the case before will go ahead and re-review everything and issue a new decision. They'll either affirm or, or alter the decision. So they may look at it and say, you know, what they did was absolutely right, they just affirm. But the difference is it's in the district office. It's still handled by that office. It tends to be done a lot quicker. The time frames are much, much shorter. Um, and it is still someone doing the everyday work. The appeals board takes a bit longer because there's, oh, there's a board, there's three judges, administrative law type judges that actually review the cases, they hear arguments, just like you'd think in a courtroom, so it takes a lot longer for them to issue their decisions. But if you're trying to argue something that maybe isn't the norm, that someone, the lawyer or the representative feels like we should change and start doing this thing, they may go that route because the reconsideration is only going to do what we currently do. They're not going to make changes to procedure. The ECAB, though, on the other hand, could say, you need to start doing this. And, and an injured employee just can't file a reconsideration um, just willy-nilly whenever they want. Like, I want someone else to review it. They need right. to submit additional evidence, whether it's new medical evidence or um, a legal argument indicating why the decision was incorrect, and then we'll review it. If they Correct. just submit a statement saying, I need someone else to look at this, um, we're just going to close out that reconsideration request. And if that employer uh, uh, goes along with the initial decision, are they the ones who send the information for the appeals board? No, 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 it all comes from the claimant. The employer, the employer can submit something if they think it's relevant to it, will read it and consider it, but it's all between the claimant and OWCP at that point. And, this, and that applies to any adverse decision. So if we do something that's against the claimant, we're not gonna pay wage loss, uh, we're not going to do, you know, we're not going to accept the claim, then we issue those appeal rights. Okay, my um, statement would be, in reference to, you were saying some suggestions, um, just as um, employees have the right to, um, they're supposed to fill out an application for um, a disability, and they have to take it to their doctors. Well, I think the same thing, sh it should be a checklist between um, coming off of workers' compensation and wanting to come on to OPM for retirement. And then that way, that I think that would help bridge some of the gaps. I and um, I can show you some copies of some checklists that we use when we're doing a retirement case, the things that we need to, as far as the health benefit information, the life insurance, um, if, they, if they want to continue their life insurance. Sure. Um, Remember, a lot of that stuff, we're at the whim of what's reported to us. 
So I agree with you. A lot of the agencies have a separation checklist that they, they're the, the tasks that they perform when they're separating the employee. And generally, workers comp are they on workers' compensation is one of the things they consider. If they do that correctly, then they don't terminate FEGLI and FEHB. If they don't do it correctly, they tend to terminate health benefits, even though we're paying and we're deducting. And then we've got to go back and sort out the mess. Oh, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, all right, so we're running really towards the end of the wire here. So do you want to just sort of skim through the last yeah. slides just so people know what's there? Um, I'll just start off right now with probably the, the most important, you know, concluding slide that we have, and that's our DFEC OWCP homepage. What we have on this homepage is um, it's all up to date. We have people that meet once a month to make sure everything on the homepage is, um, is relevant, is, is, uh, is there. We have frequently asked questions for medical providers, frequently asked questions for agencies, for claimants. Uh, we have our whole procedure manual up there. Any new information that's coming out regarding OWCP is going to be posted to our homepage. So if uh, you have any questions, you can probably find the answer to it right through that link on our homepage. Um, another tool that the agency has for authorized users, they have the ability to access the agency query system. And um, what you can do on the agency query system is gain some basic case information. You can see what a case is accepted for. You can see the case number. You can see if uh, compensation payments have been made on the case. Uh, you can see if your CA7 has at least been received and paid. On the bottom, well, on the bottom of this, you'll see the different things you can do. You can uh, check your compensation payments, check the compensation tracking, and you can do a bill inquiry. So you have the ability to go in as an agency authorized user to see if uh, medical bills were authorized, submitted, or paid. And when you look at the compensation payments, you can see a whole list of them ranging from you know, start date to finish date, whether it was paid, if it was for a schedule award, if it was for a di disability. And you can click on the link and actually see the plate. So you'll be able to see how much was taken out for uh, health benefits, how much was taken out for vision, the exact dates of it, um, if we paid 66 and 2 thirds, or if we paid 75%. So that's a tool that agencies, um, agencies like, because they can answer a lot of their questions themselves without uh, having to contact OWCP. It's okay if you go over a few minutes. Okay, good. Okay, we weren't sure. <laughs> Um, another tool that is, um, is around is the Employees Compensation Operations and Management Portal, uh, ECOMP. And what that is is a web-based application accessible via the public internet, which is intended to allow injured and federal employees to file their key workers' compensation claims. So if you work for an agency that is registered and uh, has a completed MOU between that agency and DOL, you have the ability to go onto the public internet, meaning if you're at home, if you're at work, no matter where you are, you can sign on and file your CA1 and CA2 electronically, and then it'll be routed to the supervisor, then through an injury compensation specialist, that's your agency, and ultimately to uh, OWCP. And this allows you to see uh, the exact status of the case at any time. So if you're the paper world, you can give it to your supervisor, and then you just lose track of it and just have faith that your supervisor is doing the things that they need to do in order to submit it. But in eComp, you can actually go in. You have your own little home page. It'll show you the exact status, pending review by supervisor or pending review by injury compensation specialist or even received by OWCP. Here's your claim number. You can file your CA1s, your 2s, and your 7s uh, through it. And um, you also have the ability to upload and submit documents through ECOM, which is known as WEEDS, the Web Enabled Electronic Document Submission. So if you have a medical report um, and you put it in the mail, it gets sent to our, uh, our central facility for uploading. And then finally, our claims examiner sees it. You're looking at a process of you know, five, six days before a medical report is actually in the file, or even a statement. If we needed a statement from an claimant or from the agency asking about more facts, you can upload it directly through eComp as long as you know the case number, the claimant's last name, the date of injury, and the date of birth. So as long as you have those four pieces of information, anyone can upload anything into a case file. So we see a lot of treating physicians now, instead of mailing these uh, medical reports in, they just finish their medical report, upload it directly to the case file. And now that we have these medical reports in the case file quicker, 
we're able to adjudicate these claims quicker, get these people the medical treatment they needed quicker, and then we get them back, hopefully, uh, to work quicker, which is, uh, which is one of our main goals at OWCP. Um, this is what the Ecomp homepage looks like, and if you notice on the right, that's where uh, need to upload a document, that's where you would go, you would click that green box underneath, and then the rest of the web page is uh, designed and devoted to the form filing of your key workers' compensation forms. And if there's any questions about that website, there's a very helpful uh, section called Help on the left, which has videos. Uh, they're all 503 compliant. Um, so you can review those and understand how the website works. Um, another tool that's built into Ecomp is the agency reviewer imaging. So if your agency is, um, has the MOU in place and they're utilizing Ecomp, they have the ability to designate certain officials in the agency as, um, agency, reviewer, as agency reviewers who have licenses to use imaging. So what that does is it provides those people the ability to see a case file the same way our claims examiners see it. They can request, um, they can request the case file in 24 hours. It'll be processed into Ecomp. They'll open it up and be able to see a list of all the documents that are in the case file, which is what this looks like. So if they want to see any of the current medical, they can sort it by medical. They can print it out, um, use it to make a job offer. Or if they see that there's been no medical for a while, they can reach out to our office and we can look into uh, trying to develop for additional medical through second opinions. Um, it just, it's a tool that the agencies really, really are enjoying the freedom to be able to look at these case files themselves now and be able to see if uh, the claimants actually submitted things that might not have gone through the agency. Um, so once again, this is what they all come up looking like a PDF exactly what it looks like. So you can see uh, what the CA-1 in this case looks like. Um, and finally, we talked about a timeliness goal for CA-7 through one of the questions, and that's all established through an initiative known as Protecting Our Workers and Ensuring Reemployment, which is an, initi an, an initiative um, brought about in order to you know, twofold on the safety side to make sure that people are working in safer environments and on the workers' compensation side to make sure that these uh, injuries are filed timely and that people are returning to work uh, rapidly. So these are the power goals. The first few are for the safety side to reduce the total case rate, to reduce the lost time case rate, and to analyze the lost time injury and illness data. So four through seven, and there's actually a number eight now, which is a, a regulatory requirement that all agencies have a way to file their workers' compensation forms electronically. Um, so increase the timely filing of workers' compensation claims, and that's your 10-day uh, regulation to submit those forms. Um, for the wage loss claims, number five, that is uh, the five days, and number six is to reduce the lost production days, and number seven is to increase your uh, injured worker return to work rate. And thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so that concludes our presentation. I'd like to thank everyone for their participation today, and I hope it was helpful. Uh, our contact information is available, and we will be happy to answer any questions that come our way. Thank you very much, and have a good afternoon.